So over the past four or five months, I've done a series of teachings on the history of creation, with special emphasis on the history of evil in the Bible. So far, I believe there have been about 25 videos that I've posted on my channel. And the uh, last uh, one was on Genesis chapter 3. So today, I would like to continue on to Genesis chapter 4, which tells us the story of Cain primarily. And uh, there is again so much false teachings about uh, this uh, topic, on the topic of Cain in particular. You know, many people teach that he was the son of Satan in the flesh and all that. And so, you know, we are going to see again, like what it is that the Bible actually has to teach us on this topic. So in the course, over the course of many months, as we have studied the history of creation and the history of evil, you know, like I have thought about the various fathers of evil, such as those that the only chair from the races of the angelic beings and Lucifer, who was of the sons of God, men, and finally Satan, who was an evil dragon beast. And uh, in a manner of speaking, you could say that Cain is symbolic of all three of them, that he is the father of evil. He is the evil one and a wicked one, the first uh, from the race of Adam. And therefore, he has a very special you know, place in the Bible as far as the evil of man is concerned because he was a murderer from the beginning, just like his spiritual father, the devil. And this is the reason why he's called that he was of the wicked one, on which I will uh, teach a little bit more detail as we progress through this study. Okay, this chapter 4, by the way, is mostly about Cain. It's not necessarily about Abel, uh, but the story of Abel is a very important one because he is symbolic of the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, shedding his blood on the ground, uh, being a, a sacrificial lamb, literally, because he was a keeper of sheep. So that is, of course, there, which we will discuss as well. But generally speaking, this whole chapter is more about Cain than it is about Abel. In Genesis chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, we read, And Adam knew his Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Now, the story of Cain and Abel is also one of those, you know, which about which there is a great deal of confusion and a great deal of misunderstanding and a lot of false teaching in regards to the story of Cain and Abel. Okay, we shall go through the, what Scripture is telling us here, and then you shall realize that, uh, you know, their story may be quite different from what, you know, most has been, what has been taught to us in the church for a very long time. So Adam and Eve, when did Adam know his wife, as he called, you know, he had relations with his wife Eve, and when did that happen? At the end of verse 3, we can read that so, in verse 24, so he, meaning God, drew out the man, and he placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So this is, I know, they are driven out of the garden of Eden. Okay, so they have, they are no longer in the garden. So once they have left the garden, it says Adam knew Eve, his wife. So it seems it would appear that this happened shortly after they were driven out of that garden. And Adam knew his wife, and Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. And she again bore his brother Abel. Okay. Now this year, it would appear, okay, there is a good possibility that both Cain and Abel were twins because it tells us Adam knew his wife and she conceived. So the conception is mentioned only once, but the birth is mentioned twice. So there's Cain being born and there's Abel being born. Okay, so that's that would imply or it would suggest that Cain and Abel were twins, just like Esau and Jacob were twins. And as in the story of Esau and Jacob, you know, it was the younger that was the chosen one, that was the favored one, that was the righteous one, whereas the older was the wicked one. Esau threw away his birthright over a morsel of meat, the Bible is told, tells us. And this is also the story of Cain and Abel, where it is the elder that is the wicked one, that is the evil one, and it was the younger one that was Abel, that was the righteous one. And this is, you know, this is again symbolic of Adam and Jesus, that, you know, the evil had to come first. This is the story of our conscience that I've been talking about, that the development of our conscience, that we are going to be covered by, we have to be covered by a conscience which we did not have, which Adam and Eve did not possess 
in the garden before they ate the fruit of the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, because without the knowledge of good and evil, you cannot, person cannot have a conscience. So they were conscious, they were living souls, but they were not creatures of conscience. So in the regards to the development of conscience, evil had to come first. This is why Adam and Eve turned to evil. And this is why in Bible, it is the common symbolism that the elder is the wicked one and the younger is the righteous one. So the elder being Adam, he was the evil one because he did evil, whereas Jesus being the one who the last man who came later, he was, he is the righteous one, okay? So these, this is symbolism in here in Cain and Abel story. And uh, this is also true of uh, King Saul and King David. King Saul was the first king of Israel and he was a very evil man. He did many, many evil and wicked things which are recorded in the books of First and Second Samuel. And then he was followed by King David and King David was the righteous king. So in the case of these, the elder and the younger, uh, it is like the first Adam uh, was evil and the last Adam, Jesus is righteous. And the other ones who are figures of Jesus and Adam, they are like, you know, uh, Cain and Abel. Cain would be symbolic of Adam. Abel would be symbolic or a figure of Jesus Christ. And then again, Jacob and Esau. Esau would be uh, a figure or an evil like uh, that of Cain and uh, or Adam and then it was followed by uh, Jacob who is righteous and also Saul and David. Uh, Saul was the evil one and he was followed by King David who was definitely a figure for Jesus Christ and from whose lineage came uh, the Lord Jesus in the flesh. Oh, just as an aside, I am sitting outside, so you might hear some birds chirping in the, the background. It's actually a lovely sound. Uh, you know, some of God's creatures making music unto Him, which is a topic which I love, the topic of music, because it is found everywhere in the nature. Now, one subject I also want to address is that of Cain's birth. Now, it is commonly taught that, you know, Cain was born from Satan, just like people commonly teach that Eve had sex with Satan and all that. These are lies which I have, you know, addressed many times in the past, but I do want to address the subject of Cain's birth quickly. So although I have addressed this topic many times about this, uh, you know, this false teaching that Eve had sex with Satan, you know, let me quickly go through this Genesis 3, 6 once again. And what we read in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6 is, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree to be desired to make one wise. So I've taught that already, that these were three things. That is, for, as far as the body is concerned, she saw that it was good for the food. She didn't say that, you know, it is something that was going to, turn her on and she was going to have uh, relations with a man or some other creature. No, nothing like that. So it was good for food. So as far as the bodily temptation was concerned, it was just that it seemed to be to her that it was good for food. And then it was pleasant to the eyes. So it was good to, you know, it's, it's the mind, the soul. It pleases the mind, the soul. And then a tree to be desired to make one wise is that it was uh, spiritually something that was desirable. So it, it was attracted to her. It was tempting to her in her body, soul and spirit. But as far as the body is concerned, it has nothing to, uh, to do with having like, you know, sex or something like that. And then it says she took of the fruit thereof and did eat. And people say this, this meaning of this word did eat is that she had sex with the devil, with the serpent. Okay, fine. If that's what it means, what does it continue on in this same verse? And gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. So Adam ate too. So does that mean, you know, that Adam was having relations with the serpent as well, carnal relations? You know what I mean? It's just ridiculous teachings that people, that the Bible says no such thing, yet people twist it to make it mean something which is not from Scripture. It comes from other sources, such as the Book of Enoch and stuff, which is a very corrupt document, as I've taught many times, but it is not in the Bible. So let's stick to what the Bible is teaching us, and the Bible is quite plain in what it says. Jesus said, you know, let your yea be yea and let your nay be nay. And you know, who follows that uh, principle more than anybody else? It is God. When he says something, he means it exactly the way it is written. And that's why I love, it says my, my, my uh, words are plain to him that understands. I love God's word because it is plain when we read it with the eyes, with our spiritual eyes that we have received from the Lord our God and from our Lord Jesus Christ through our spiritual birth in Him by our faith in Jesus Christ. 
because there is much confusion and much false teaching in regards to this matter. So who did who was Cain born of? Who were his parents? Was he born of Satan, the serpent, or was his father and mother Adam and Eve? Let us look at Genesis 4, 4 verse 1. What does the Bible teach us? That's what we are here to learn, not what, you know, Book of Enoch or some other document might be saying. If they say that Cain's father was Satan, fine, but not in the Bible. In the Bible, we read in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, And Adam knew his wife. That word knew, which I've spoken about before, is the word uh, yada, Hebrew H3, 3045, which means to know somebody or to experience someone. In one of his meaning is literally to have relations, you know, to uh, like a man and woman have. If that's So when it says Adam knew his wife, is basically is telling us that Adam had a relations with his wife. He slept with his wife, okay? And she conceived. So what it is telling us here is, that Adam impregnated Eve, to put it bluntly, okay? That's what happened. They had relations, and she got pregnant from him. And then what happens? And bore Cain. Okay, so as a result of this union between Adam and Eve, Cain was born Cain. Therefore, the Bible leaves no doubt that the parentage of Cain were the father was Adam and the mother was Eve. Now, that's the end of it. That's all that the Bible teaches us. Therefore, if anybody wants to believe differently, that is fine. Now I will tell you why the Bible also tells us that Cain was of the wicked one. And again, people, people say that it means that he has, he, his father was Satan. But that is not what it means because the Bible again explains what it is teaching just by us looking at the words carefully. So in Genesis 4.1, we learn that Adam knew his wife, that he had relations with his wife, then she conceived, she was impregnated by him, she bore Cain, she gave birth to Cain, therefore the father was Adam, the mother was Eve, and she said, I have gotten a man from the Lord, I, meaning I am his mother, that he has been born to me, and his father is Adam. Now let us also look at, uh, you know, John, 1 John 3.12, which is the common verse that is taught, that, you know, Cain's father was the devil. And it says in verse 12, in 1 John 3, 12, you read, Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one. But does that mean that, you know, his uh, lineage, his physical lineage is being referred to? Not at all. Because it will go on to explain what this means, that he was of the wicked one. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? So here's the answer. What is meant by this little phrase, that he was of that wicked one? Because his own works were evil. Okay, so it is telling us that his, his wickedness, his evil, his being a son of the devil has nothing to do that the devil was his physical father, but he was his spiritual father. That like the devil, the works of Cain were evil. That's what made him a child of the devil. And that is what the Bible teaches us, that the devil has children, but they are children in the spirit. They're not children of the flesh. They are people that follow him that obey him, that serve him by doing evil, and that's how they become sons of the devil, literally, okay? They are not because they were born of him or their mothers were serpents or something like that, no. They are still born of a man and a woman, but because in their hearts are evil, out of the heart of man proceed evil thoughts, Jesus thought, because they have evil hearts, their conscience is evil, it is defiled, that's what makes them of the wicked one that is the meaning okay this is what the bible teaches now if somebody wants to believe anything different that is entirely up to them but please don't say that the bible is telling us that satan was the physical father of cain so again she bore his brother abel and abel was a keeper of sheep but cain was a tiller of the ground see now it is generally taught and it is generally assumed that cain and abel were mere boys you know like youth maybe 18, 20 years old or something when Cain killed Abel. You know, this I believe is false, that Cain and Abel were much older, possibly, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of 100 or 100, more than 100 years old, when this event of what happened to between Cain and Abel took place. And why do we, why do I say that? What does the Bible tell us in verse two in Genesis chapter four? It says, Abel was a keeper of sheep, okay? Now, just imagine this, you know, Adam and Eve were driven out of the garden, okay? 
and Adam and Eve have this these twins. They're the firstborn, uh, Cain, and then Abel, okay? Or if they could be, not even if they weren't twins, you know, they were very close in age to each other. So they have these two boys. So if it's only four people on the earth, okay, why would there be a need for, you know, being a keeper of sheep or being a tiller of the ground? You understand? Like by this time, the story of Cain and Abel has told us, we have something that husbandry, which is like, you know, the keeping of cattle, it seems to have been quite well developed by this time. And a tiller of the ground, their agriculture also seems to have been, you know, well developed by the time this story takes place. So how, how long did the, all, all that take to happen? Okay, and were these just four people on the earth when this happened? I would say not. I would say that, you know, Cain and Abel were born, that they were grown up, and Adam and Eve had other children in the meantime. So the population of the earth had already been increasing sufficiently that they had this, uh, you know, this, this occupation of keeping cattle had already become an occupation as well as that of farming and agriculture. It was quite well developed by this time, okay? I would speculate that Cain and Abel were well over 100 years old when Cain killed Abel, and uh, I'll get to that in a minute as to why what we can learn from the Bible that would suggest that this was indeed the case. And in the process of time, it came to pass. See again, like when it, when it, when Bible uses terms such as the process of time, you know, we don't really know like what is that uh, few days, few years, few decades, you know, hundreds of years. It could mean anything, right? It could indicate any length of time, but we know some period of time went by before this event that that is very significant took place. In verse 3, and in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Now, again, we can learn something here that, you know, not only after they were driven out of the garden, that they had now established some sort of civilization where they had like farming, where they had agriculture, where they had the, you know, the, the, they were husbandmen, where they, which means that, you know, they knew how to keep cattle and to raise cattle sheep, etc. So this had already happened. But more than that, in verse 40, in the, in the process of time, in verse 3, it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. That, you know, they had also developed some form of worshiping of God, okay, some sort of ritual worship that had been introduced to them and that they were practicing where they were bringing offerings unto the Lord God, okay. So this had already been developed as well. All these things don't happen overnight. These things take time, and they also require that there be at least like, you know, some number of people that are present to be involved in these occupations and to be, you know, cognizant of and also practicing this ritual worship of God, which had been introduced by this time. So once again, when we compare scripture to scripture, we can learn so much about history in the Bible. Although the practice of the priesthood, the ritual official priesthood of the Old Testament was not established under Moses much, much later, but it is, does not mean that in the pre-flood days there was no worship or there was no formal worship that already went on. For example, we can read in Jude verse 14, and Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these okay so yes the prophets of god already existed in the pre-flood days and once again we can read about uh, noah in second peter chapter 2 it tells us and verse 5 and spared not the old world but saved noah the eighth person a preacher of righteousness okay so this uh the prophets and preachers of god have existed in the pre-flood days going back I would say right to the time of Adam and Eve once they left the garden, okay? And Abel was the first, you could say, high priest in the Bible because he certainly is a type or a figure of the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, when he brings to God this offering which we shall study, then it becomes apparent that, you know, this worship, this some type of formal worship, in which sacrifices and offerings were made unto God had already been established, which would mean 
that there had to be a certain number of people that were already on the earth at that time, okay? That this idea that Cain and Abel were just mere little boys when Cain killed Abel, I don't think it is true. They actually may even have been hundreds of years old. We do not know for sure what their age was, but I would speculate that, you know, they were well, like, you know, well over a hundred years or maybe much older than that because of this, uh, again, this form of worship that has been established. There's a society, there's a civilization, there's husbandry taking place, which requires the people be established in a certain place that they're not nomads. There was uh, farming that was taking place. So yes, this, this would seem that there was already a place, a city or uh, some type of, uh, you know, a, a gathering of people in one place and they had a certain structure of government and governance and also of their practices of religion were already established by this time. So in the process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground and offering unto the Lord. And Abel, verse 4, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock and the fat of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. Okay. So yeah, so we have this here, that's some sort of religious practice and uh, you know, ceremonial ritual offering, etc. This had been something like a precursor to what happened to Moses when they were given the law and they were told how to worship God and to serve him. And you know, what sort of practice, what sort of rituals, etc. That, uh, that would be necessary when God was being worshiped. So we have like a preliminary a preliminary view of something that had already been introduced at the time of shortly after Adam and Eve left the Garden of Eden. Now Cain brought God an offering, okay? He brought something which is to be told, the fruit of the ground. Now there's nothing wrong with bringing the fruit of the ground because in, uh, in Leviticus and in uh, Exodus and, you know, other uh, parts of the Old Testament in particular, we can read about, uh, you know, God says, you know, to bring an offering of the fruit of the ground, which is like rains and other, you know, produce, etc. It is offered to the Lord, so there's nothing wrong with that. So what it most likely meant was that when Cain brought this offering, you know, he could be just like passing by, no, I gotta go give God an offering. So he just grabbed a few cabbages or something like that and you know just presented it to the Lord. There was no there was no value added that it was not done out of a reverential heart that he gave God this offering, which is the reason why God did not have respect for it. And in the case of Cain, Abel, we also learned something very interesting here, that he brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. So, you know, this animal sacrifice, which of course, you know, God first introduced in Genesis 3 when he made coats of skins for Adam and Eve, about which I spoke in the last chapter last uh, part of the series, you know, so this this idea of animal sacrifice, of sacrifice to sacrificial lamb, which is what that pointed to, had already been introduced again to the civilization, the civilization that had developed on the earth already by this time, okay? So Abel knew, you know, when he when he brought God an offering, like he chose the best that he had to offer, Whereas Cain was, you know, much more nonchalant and casual about it, it would appear. So Cain, Abel brought to God the firstling of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. So God first had respect unto Abel because he respected the thoughts and the, the, the reverence and the love that was in the heart of Abel for the Lord. God respected that and therefore he respected his offering, okay? It is not the offerings that make us, you know, uh, valued in the eyes of God. It is the heart with which we give those offerings that make us valuable. See, what we learn from the story of Cain and Abel is that there's a great deal of difference between uh, serving God ritually as something that might be thought of as a requirement and serving him reverentially from the heart. And uh, later on in Isaiah 29, 13, we can read, Wherefore the Lord said, For as much as these people draw near me with their mouth, 
and with their lips to honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. So it is the heart that matters. It is not what we say with our lips or what we even might do. Like, you know, in those old days, for example, you know, people saying, oh man, it's the Sabbath, you know, I gotta go into the temple, I'd rather sleep in. And then, you know, like Psalm 100, it says, you know, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. There are those people who come with joy, with, uh, with, with praise on their lips, you know, because they want to go to the house of the Lord. It is the heart that matters. And this again from Isaiah 29, 13, Jesus also quoted that in Matthew 15, 8, where he said, you know, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So the difference between Cain and Abel was that Cain did what was required, but out of a sense of obligation. It wasn't out of love for God, whereas with Abel, it was done with love and respect for God. So Abel respected God, so God had respect for him. Uh, Cain did not. Okay? He did not respect God. He didn't really care for him. And therefore, God did not have respect for his offering. And But unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect. So again, it is not just the offering that God did not have respect to. It is Cain himself, the person. Okay, it was the person who did not have it in his heart to serve God, to respect God. He did not have respect for God, therefore God did not have respect for him. And it says, but unto Cain and to his offering, he had not respect, and Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. So he was very angry at this, that God did not treat him the same way as he treated Abel. Okay, this is the beginning of jealousy and envy, not because, you know, of something that the other person does, but because of something that we ourselves lack. Okay, people become jealous of other people because they themselves perceive themselves to be less than that person, okay? It is the inferiority complex, and that's what Cain had, and therefore he became very, very angry, and his countenance fell. And so God, I mean, it was like his anger was very obvious. It wasn't something that, you know, he just... Uh, briefly thought about in his mind and that was it no his countenance his face his demeanor everything you know it was it expressed quite clearly that he was very very wroth okay and the lord said unto cain why art thou wroth and why is thy countenance fallen if you do well shall not you be accepted earlier i had quoted from 1 john 3 12 which taught us that cain was of the wicked one not because satan or the serpent was his father in the flesh but because he was a child of the devil in the spirit, because his works were evil. And this again is being confirmed by the Lord God himself here in verse 7, where God said to Cain, if you do well, shall you not be accepted? So again, God is telling him that your works are evil. Okay, that's why you have not been accepted. That is why sin is lying at your door and it will rule over you then you will become of the wicked one because you will be overpowered by sin and evil and therefore you will be spiritually wicked. That teaching again is confirmed right here in verse 7 that Cain's works were evil. That is why he was not accepted. That is why he was of the wicked one. So, you know, obviously in giving this offering, Cain had not done well. Like I said, you know, it wasn't done with respect. It wasn't done with reverence. It was done as a duty, or oh, this is what I have to do. You know, when, when we start to think, when we feel obliged to do something, then it doesn't come from the heart. And that's what happened with Cain. Okay, if you do well, shall you not be accepted? And if you do not well, sin lies at the door. And this is a very good lesson for us. That, you know, the more we give ourselves over to not doing that, we to doing things that we know we should not, then that sin, it is already at the door at all times. And all it requires is for a little crack in that door and it'll pounce right in. Sin lies at the door and unto thee shall be his desire. You know, like we read in First Peter in chapter 5 where uh, the apostle Peter wrote, you know, that the hate, be sober, be vigilant for your adversary the devil walketh about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. 
Okay, so this is that imagery here that there is this, you know, this this uh, lion, this killer that is lurking outside the door of our hearts. And if we allow these type of feelings, these type of, uh, you know, this jealousy and envy and other devilish things to enter in, then that killer is ready to pounce and to devour us, okay? Sin lies at the door, and to thee shall be his desire, and you shall rule over him. This is very interesting that in regards to sin, in this here, in this verse of scripture in Genesis 4, 7, there's a personal pronoun, him, is used, that you shall rule over him, where sin is actually personified as a person, just like, you know, in Peter, where he said, like, as a roaring lion, the adversary, the devil. So there is, like, you know, sin is actually a spirit, it's more than one spirit. It's like, you know, countless evil spirits that are ever ready to look for any, any crack in our defense and to come in and to try and devour us. Once again, we can learn so much from this imagery of sin crouching at the door like a lion ready to pounce, uh, as we read about in 1 Peter 5, 8, that we understand from Romans 5.12, which tells us, whereas by one man sin entered into the world. And, you know, that's the teachings I've done in the past, that sin and evil were already in God's creation even before Adam was created. Sin had already been perfected. Evil had already become fully dark. It was absolute evil. And essentially in the serpent, the devil, and all his host, they were all crouching at the door waiting to enter this world, just waiting for Adam to open that door. And when he did, it brought what? You can read in Romans 5, 12, whereas by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. So it brought death. And death is not just, you know, when the body dies. Death is all forms of pain because we live a living death. From the day we are born, we begin to die. So that is the consequence of what Adam did. But I wanted to compare this to the imagery of what God was telling Cain. The sin is crouching or it is lying at your door. It's waiting to pounce on you. And anybody that gives in to the desires of sin, of lusts and other things that are evil, they are going to be overpowered and in the end destroyed by it. Okay. But this again proves that you know sin and evil have a beginning much before Adam and Eve were created and placed in the Garden of Eden. So, obviously, Cain and Abel, by this morning time, and I suppose the rest of the people that were living, they knew what was right and wrong. They had, they had been given some education in it, that there were certain expectations that had been laid upon them, just like the law was given to the Israelites under Moses later on. Okay, So these expectations that were given or that were expected of them, they had knowledge of. Otherwise, you know, why would God hold Cain responsible if he had no idea of what he was supposed to do and what he was supposed to bring? They had been given an understanding. And once we have the understanding of good and evil, of right and wrong, and then, you know, we continue to choose to do which is evil and which is wrong, then, you know, that's what we should expect, that this sin, which is a symbolic of all the spirits of evil, of all the devils that inhabit this world in the unseen dimensions, they are ready to pounce and to devour us, okay? And they devour us through filling us with, you know, all the, you know, like we have the fruits of the spirit, but we have works of the flesh, such as envy and jealousy and hatred and, you know, concupiscence and uh, any of the other evils like murders and whatever, you name it. It, you know, that's what it, it is ready to fill us with. And again, that goes back to the cloak of conscience. You know, whose cloak are we going to be cloaked with? Who is going to cover our nakedness? Is it going to be Satan, the devil, or the serpent, or is it going to be the Lord God? In the case of Cain and Abel, this is a very good example where of Cain, we are told that he was of the wicked one. So the cloak, his conscience, his, his you know, covering was that of the devil. It was of the evil one. It was of the prince of darkness. Therefore, his heart was dark. Whereas that of Abel, being the righteous one, he had covered himself with the covering of the Lord, that the coats of skin that God had made for Adam and Eve is symbolized 
the sacrifice of the Lamb of God, which would then cover us with his own blood and purge us of all this evil. This had happened to Abel. And this is again, you know, teaches us that, you know, what happened to Adam had to happen. But later on, Jesus would come and he would take that covering of evil away and he would purge that out of our hearts and he would make us righteous just as Abel is, was righteous. So in regard to Cain, you know, we think that he was rejected or he, his offering was not accepted. God did not have respect to it because, but that was the first time he'd ever done something wrong. But that is probably not the case. That Cain, by this time, as I said, he was probably, you know, like oh, much older than we think, you know, of them, generally speaking, that he was certainly not a youth, what we would consider to be like a teenage boy or, you know, early young man, like in his 20s. He was much older than that. So therefore, it is quite probable that he already had a track record of doing evil works. And that is exactly what we read in John 1 John 3 12 that his works were evil it doesn't say his one work of not bringing God a proper offering was evil the only evil work that he ever did no so Cain had a heart of darkness in him which is what caused him in that instance not to bring the offering with respect and reverence to God as he should have but because he himself had other sinful desires that he had other sinful desires that he was controlled by and these must already have been working in his life by that time the rage with which he rose up and slew Abel that doesn't happen because of one incident that happens as something that becomes one's personality one's person over the course of time so it is my contention that Cain already had, you know, and hatred and malice and jealousy and envy, all these were already operating in him from perhaps a very young age. Then in verse 8, it tells us, and Cain talked with Abel, his brother. Now, you know, this again is something which we don't know how much period of time went by after this incident that Cain talked to Abel. Okay. We assume that it happened immediately, but it might not have. It might have taken years after that where this hatred and this, you know, it built in Cain and it built in Cain and it built in Cain till it became murderous. Yes, so it, it is possible that that time when Cain's offering was not accepted was just the beginning of this birth of this jealousy and envy towards Abel because Abel was uh, was declared to be righteous, where he was Cain was Cain was not accepted. Okay, so that could have been the beginning, and over a period of time, the jealousy and envy towards Abel grew and grew and grew, and the hatred for his brother in his heart built up. So this could have happened uh, in a period of time following this incident with the offerings uh, that uh, we read about in the beginning of this chapter. Secondly. It is also apparent from verse 8 here uh, that Cain talked with Abel, his brother, it tells us, which means that what Cain did was premeditated because he planned this out. He talked to brother is that he must have done something, you know, explained to him or, or somehow deceived him into coming out into the field. The field is Cain's territory because he was, you know, he, he was a tiller of the ground, right? where uh, we are told that he was a, a tiller of the ground in verse 2. So he was tilling these fields, so it's quite possible that he deceptively asked Abel, you know, hey brother, can you come and help me or something? But he had murder in his heart. So uh, I think that what we learn from this uh, simple phrase in there that Cain talked with Abel, his brother, is that Cain's crime, let's say, was not one of passion. Okay, It wasn't something that uh, he did without thinking about it beforehand. It seems that he had been thinking about it and planning it for some time, which is why he talked with Abel and took him out into the field. There's much symbolism here as well, the cane being a tiller of the ground. Man was formed from the dust of the ground, we are told, okay? So 
the, in this respect, the field, it represents essentially the world or mankind. So this is this world that kills, it murders, it destroys. And therefore, the only salvation, the only way to save the world, God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. The only way to save the world was by shedding the blood of the lamb. And that is what Cain symbolically did there was his blood was shed. The lamb's blood was shed by the evil of the heart of man as it is symbolized or represented by Cain. So Cain deliberately did what he did. Evil, you know, like Adam and Eve, even after they had uh, eaten the fruit of the tree and the knowledge of good and evil, and evil entered into the world, I mean, you know, they still, God was teaching them what good is, and they could choose to do good. But of course, man is not capable of doing that. Therefore, whatever man does, his evil is premeditated. Okay, we know what good is, but yet if we do evil, then it is because we are not just doing this because without thinking about it, but it is something that we have knowledge of, we have understanding of, we have given thought to, yet we still do it. So like Cain, you know, man is a premeditated murderer. Uh, he murders with premeditation, who does evil with premeditation, just as a Cain did when he murdered Abel, his brother. It was not, like I said, something that happened on the spur of the moment without, previous, uh, without any previous intention of doing something like that. He fully planned it, and then he took Abel, his brother into the field and that is where he murdered him. Was it murderous that very instant when God rejected his offering? I don't know. I probably, I, I think not. I think, you know, generally to get to that level where the hatred become murderous, it happens in the process of time. A person thinks about it. He dwells upon this and, you know, oh, that man, you know, I just hate his guts and, you know, look at the evil, you know, that's, this is something which builds and builds and builds. So we don't know how much time might have gone by after that incident with this offering that Cain talked with Abel, his brother, but it could have been a significant period of time. And it came to pass when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. Okay? And the Lord said unto Cain, so this is what happened. You know, he killed, just like in Esau's heart, there was a murderous desire to kill Jacob because Jacob had usurped his birthright. Okay? And he wanted to kill him. Okay, so that murder and the hatred it built inside of him. Same thing happened to Cain. And in the case of Cain, he actually executed those plans, which is again symbolic of the sacrifice of the Lamb of God, that it is the older one who killed him. It was men that crucified him, right? It is the evil man with evil in his heart that came before the righteous Savior would come. And it is those first man, Adam, and his descendants that were evil in their conscience, that would kill and murder him. That is what we learn from the story of Cain and Abel, okay? That it is the evil because we had been infected with that evil. Therefore, our heart had become a heart of darkness. It was a heart of evil and murder. It was a heart filled with violence, even as we shall see in the next, in a couple of chapters in Genesis chapter six, that the earth was filled with violence. And it was because like Cain, we, were the unrighteous ones, that we hated him who is righteous, which is Christ Jesus our Lord, and therefore we crucified him in our hatred. Okay, just like Cain killed his brother Abel. Ultimately, we can say that Cain is a type of the devil himself. Okay, he was called off the wicked one because he had the heart of his father, the devil. Okay, he was a cold-blooded murderer, just like about the devil Jesus said, that he was a murderer from the beginning. Cain was a murderer from the beginning. Okay, He was a cold-blooded murderer who murdered his brother with great premeditation. He did not murder him in a fit of rage, but he did it with pre-planning, with premeditation, with hatred in his heart that he rose up against him and slew him. Okay, so thus he has become a type of the devil, just as Abel is a type of Jesus Christ, of the Lamb of God. And this 
uh, in the end, Cain has come to represent all mankind, the evil of all man. It is in that very time that Cain lived, in those generations before the flood. In within a matter of ten generations, we are told that the earth became filled with violence, and it was people were killing and murdering each other, like in May in, in numbers and ways that we can't even begin to imagine. And in the end, it was the generation of Jesus Christ Himself, when Jesus, who was a type of Abel, walked the earth. He said to his generation, he declared them to be evil and dark and sinful, just like this Cain. And we can read that in Matthew 24, in Matthew 23, verses 34 and 35, on which I've done in extensive studies about the evil generation that was alive at the time of Jesus Christ, that that has been the most evil generation that has ever lived. And you could say that that whole generation was like Cain. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues, and persecute them from city to city. And you know, this, I believe, was also must have happened with Cain and Abel, that he must have persecuted Abel before he actually rose up and killed him. As I said, his hatred built for him over time, that it does not mean that he killed him on the very day of this incident with the offerings. It is possible that it happened much later. But look at this here in verse 35 in Matthew 23, that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of righteous Abel unto the blood of Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom he slew between the temple and the altar. And this generation of Jesus Christ was declared to be like Cain, the murderer, who slew his righteous brother Abel and shed his blood upon the ground. He killed him in cold blood, but the warm blood that fell upon the earth cried out to the Lord for vengeance, and that vengeance was taken upon the generation of, of Jesus Christ, the most evil and wicked generation that has ever lived upon the earth, just like the wicked one Cain, who slew his own brother in cold blood. So did Jesus' generation who saw more signs and more wonders and more miracles than any generation in history slew their own savior, their own Abel, on the crucified him on the cross and slew him in cold blood. So I will continue this study in part two because there's so much more uh, nuggets of truth, so many more nuggets of truth that are hidden in this one chapter from which we can learn so much more not just about Cain and Abel and about good and evil, about God and the devil. And that's, of course, the theme that runs throughout the Bible is the theme of good and evil because evil it is that teaches us what good is. And in, in the case of Cain and Abel, we again understand that it was the comparison between the two. The one became to be the type of the devil, Satan, the serpent, and the other one, Abel, was the type of the Lord Jesus Christ shedding his own blood to save us and that my dear friends is uh, this uh, will conclude part one of the study on Genesis chapter 4. Oh,
city said the camp is free. Thank you.